Okay, hello. Um, so I guess first I should announce, I sent an email about this, that I set my ops hours. Um, it's going to be um, It's going to be one in-person office hour. Wednesday, three to four in my office. And uh, but you could also attend this office hour by Zoom. Um, and then there'll be, uh, so this is like, well, this. so this is in person or Zoom. And then Thursday, 1130, 30. that was 11.30. Not at night, 11 30 a.m., 12 30 p.m., um, is a Zoom only offset. Um, and the Zoom links are on the online syllabus in yeah, a couple other places. But, uh, okay. Um, I could set, I didn't do this, right? Did I do this? No, I don't think so. But I, but I, Maybe I should send everyone in Zoom invitations to both of us just to have the link. Maybe I did that. <laughs> it's all blurred. All right. Um, uh, all right. So I'm going to start by talking about, unless I let, well, I'll start by talking about form and matter. All right. Um, that's, you know, there was a little blurb written by me at the beginning of the reading about form and matter. We didn't read the things that text in Aristotle are about that. Um, so, I mean, like when Aristotle uh, discusses form and matter, um, he, um, uses the example of a bronze sphere or a, I think somewhere else he talks about a bronze statue um, where, so in that, he says that the matter is the bronze and the form is the shape. Um, so that makes form and that matter sound like pretty kind of like ordinary things. <laughs> um, However, uh, that kind of matter, matter that itself, right? So bronze is a substance. Um, it's a mixture of the elements, right? Like it has water in it, as you can tell from the fact that it melts. <laughs> you know. All right. Um, anyway, so uh, bronze is a mixture of the elements. It's a, it's a, that's a, it's a kind of substance. Um, so in that case, the thing that Aristotle is calling the, the matter is itself a substance. Um, and that's what people call proximate matter. Um, so like proximate matter is, you know, all the things you would normally think of as what something is made out of. But what, but when I'm talking about matter, um, in this lecture, but also when the later people talk about matter, they're mostly be thinking about something much stranger, <laughs> which is called prime matter. Or many times, actually, the ancient Neoplatonists will just call it matter. Um, and as I said, one of the reasons I didn't have Aristotle have, you know, assign the readings from Aristotle about form and matter is that the interpretation is so like complicated and weird. Um, whether, you know, is the is proximate matter really matter at all? Or is, is this, this really matter? And that's just an analogy or, you know, so on and so forth. But anyway, what we're talking about here is, is matter or prime matter. Um, and why, um, and, okay, so I should say one more thing. Um, many 
recent interpreters of Aristotle, although not all, think that um, prime matter is not an Aristotelian concept at all. <laughs> right? Again, you see like the very wide range of the ways Aristotle can be interpreted. So many like contemporary interpreters of Aristotle would tell you that prime matter was something that was invented by later Aristotelians and it's just misread into Aristotle's text. However, uh, if that's true, there, you know, uh, there doesn't remain any trace of any Aristotelians who didn't believe in prime matter. <laughs> right? That is, uh, the entire Aristotelian tradition believes in prime matter. And it's only like in modern times that people start to go back and question that traditional interpretation. So for our purposes, this is an Aristotelian concept. And why, what does Aristotle need this for? Well, so like, so here's Bucephalus. Now, I mean, so we already, we saw that the distinction between substance and accidents can explain certain um, kinds of change um, that, uh, might seem impossible, right? And that the pre-Socratics, you know, of various types argued were impossible. <laughs> um, and therefore that there is no change or whatever. Like, so for example, here's little B Bucephalus, right? Like when Bucephalus was younger, he was smaller. And then he changed as time went on. He grew and he changed into a big Bucephalus. So the small received largeness. <laughs> the small became large. That's impossible. Small can't be large. They're contrasts. Well, there's something a little complicated about that, but never mind. <laughs> All right. The small can't be large. They're contraries. How is that possible? Answer. Well, really, the small doesn't receive the large. The substance of Bucephalus first receives one contrary and then the other, small, large, right? These are accidents in the category of quantity. Of course, not quality. We were mostly talking about before, the same idea. Um, okay, so the distinction between substance and accidents can explain that kind of change. What happens when Bucephalus dies? If you're dead, Bucephalus, <laughs> right? So what happens at this point? Well, so this turns into this. Now, this is a horse, right? That, that's, that's Bucephalus species. So that's Bucephalus's essence that makes Bucephalus what he is, his nature of being a horse. Um, this is not a horse, right? I mean, we call it a dead horse, but of course, it, horse, of course, sorry, but, but of course, it's, it's, it's not really a horse, right? I mean, it, it, it no longer, for example, has the capacity to neg. <laughs> Right. Um, it, it no longer has any of the capacity to live horses. Philosophy. Uh, the rational. What is this? Well, it's it's probably not a single substance. Aristotle. Right. It's probably Baker. actually consists of Spinoza. different um, inanimate substances, kind of like mixed together. Interesting, but not the most. Um, but whatever it is, it's not this substance anymore. It doesn't have the it doesn't have the um, species horse. It doesn't have the essence horse, or Aristotle will say it doesn't have the form of horse. And as I say, I think in a footnote, although I also say not to think about this too much, or it will confuse you, that the same Greek word ados is was translated into Latin both as species and as form. In different contexts. So it's actually the same word. This is this word ados is where we get the suffix oi from. It means like kind of an appearance or something like that in ordinary Greek. 
but in philosophical Greek, it means species or form. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, so the form, the the form of horse is gone. So, and yet, um, this changed into this. <clears throat> So I mean, there's different ways of putting this, but I guess I could say the same thing I did again. But like, how did something that had the form of a horse receive the non-form of horse or the form of something else? By the way, this this process here, when one substance ceases to exist, this is called corruption. Right, corruption is the kind of change when a substance ceases to exist, rather than just changing its accidents. And this, when a new substance, or as I said, in this case, it's really like a whole, probably a whole bunch of new substances. But anyway, when a new substance comes into existence, that's called generation, right? So, and that's why you remember the title of Aristotle's book on generation and corruption. Um, he's discussing the elements in there because a simple example of this process is that, for example, uh, if you get water really hot, it turns into air. That's not really true, right? But in Aristotle world, it's true. <laughs> when you get water really hot, it turns into air. Yeah. So whenever a form changes into another form, it's called generation. So just in this example, it's going from like the form of force to now. Yeah, so whenever a substance ceases to exist, it's called corruption. And whenever a substance, whenever a substance naturally ceases to exist, it's called corruption. And whenever a substance naturally comes into existence, it's called generation. I'm adding naturally to, to, to rule out creation and annihilation, which is a whole different or transubstantiation also relevant to today's reading. Yeah. So in the example of the frog statue that Forms yeah. is matter in the form of the statue. How is that concept of form? I have a sinking feeling that this is a stupid question. How is that concept of form different from the concept of shape as an accident? Well, it's, I mean, so that's why a lot of people say that's not really an example of form and matter. It's just analogous, right? And so they'll say, uh, you know, a statue is an artificial thing, right? Remember I was saying before that, that according to a lot of people, artificial things as such are not really substances and its form is an accident. That, so like, in other words, what we do when we make a statue is we take a substance and we can't make it into a new substance, right? Like that's beyond human powers, but we can change its accidents. And so, we, for example, we can change its shape. Um, um, and, you know, a bronze statue is a simple example of that. When you make a table out of different kinds of material, you take different substances, you change their shape, you stick them together, et cetera, right? So on the other hand, there's, you know, there are other ways of looking at it where in, like maybe in some sense, that is a real example of form and matter, but not the fundamental one. And so it's, first of all, it definitely is not a stupid question. <laughs> it's just, it's it's so not stupid that I can't answer it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, is for, so is form what makes matter sensible? Form is what makes matter um, a specific thing, right? That is, it gives it species. It makes it something. I haven't, by the way, I haven't said matter yet. <laughs> right, but, but right, so because what I was going to say is right. So how can it be that the form of force would receives the form of something else, right? Or in the simple example of water changing into air, where there's definitely just one substance on each side, right? How does the form of water receive the form of air when they're not consistent with each other? They're different species. So again, the answer is, well, they that doesn't really happen. There's really something that receives both, and that's the matter. Right? That, that, um, 
Greek word that Aristotle uses here, thule, actually means wood <laughs> or like lumber. But of course, he's using that special technical sense. Yeah. Um, are you using the otter thing? Am I using it? Oh, it's the students who use it, but it's true. Usually, I get a whole bunch of requests for people to use their otter. And I didn't get that now, and I don't know why. Because <laughs> I always accept them when I get them. Maybe I was distracted and they timed out or something. Can you try again? I'm not really, this otter thing is new to me. It just appeared this quick. <laughs> yeah, I've got a bunch of emails. Well, it's, apparently it's popular because there's a whole bunch of people in the course who have been having their otter. And I mean, it, it takes notes and stuff. I looked at the notes and some of them are, uh, yeah, but it's pretty good for for a machine. Yeah. I have found quite kind of useful as like a transcription of what you say, when it is accurate, which it isn't always. Yeah, it isn't but always. Whenever I've tried to look at them, they only let me see part of the transcript for free, which isn't great. Oh. I don't know if that's. Hmm. No, me too. Presumably, the people who are making the requests have a paid account. Yeah, but if they don't have a paid but, account, okay. But to... so, but if if anyone is trying to use it and it's not working, because I don't see them, I don't see those Otter clients that I usually see here. Mm -hmm. They like they they like attend the meeting. Um. Um. Yeah, if anyone wants to try that again and see what happens, or all right, I'm not seeing anything. I I, I don't know. Like I don't work for Otter, so <laughs> to do about it. But uh, anyway, um, right. So what was I saying? So the matter. Um, receives first the form of horse and then the form of, or I mean, again, if it's easier to understand in the water to air example. We have the matter. And we have the form of water, which is succeeded by the form of air. So first we have the form of water in matter. And then we have the form of air in that. And this is prime matter, which means that um, it's the matter of substantial form, or um, it's the matter that isn't anything specific without the form. It's matter that isn't anything specific without the form. Right? It has no species. It has no form or essence of its own. It, it, it receives one substantial form or another. Um, so matter receives form in order to make it a specific species of substance? Yeah. And so for that reason, you can never have prime matter without any substantial form, right? Because that's nothing in particular. It's just like the potentiality of being something. It's, it's so you never have it by itself. Um, but um, at least all the types of substances that are subject to generation and corruption, that is all sublunar substances, um, Share the same kind of prime matter. That is the, the the prime the sublunar prime matter is the potentiality for any sublunar substantial. Yeah. So it seems to me that the importance of matter is that even when the form changes, there is something that must stay the same. Right. That's why we know that there's matter and form. Um, how do we know that? 
celestial substances have matter if they don't ever change? Well, um, the short answer is we don't. It's not clear oh, okay. <laughs> whether substan whether celestial substances have prime matter or not. And different Aristotelians, or like either A, you can say that there is no composition of matter and form in celestial substances. Then you have to explain how they're different from immaterial substances. Right? Or you can say that there is prime matter of celestial substances, but it's different from sublunar prime matter. And it's kind of like completely taken up by the form of the celestial substance. So that, this is what Thomas Aquinas says, for example. Mm -hmm. So there's no room for it to change into anything else. Um, or you can say, this is what Avicenna says, that it's actually the same prime matter, but that, um, and it's, it's something about the form of the celestial substances that prevents generation and corruption. They, right, it's like a special property of the celestial substances. Um, so, fortunately, uh, we don't have to get into that. Well, should I say that? I mean, <laughs> um, we don't have to get involved in it for these readings. It's not irrelevant to the things the rationalists talk about. All of this stuff about like angels and celestial spheres and whatever, even though the early modern people don't believe in it, there's like, um, there's like reflections of it in the way they, they set up the world. So that like, as I think I said at some point, Leibniz basically is gonna end up saying the whole world is made of angels. <laughs> yeah. So when in, in the first Aristotle reading you did, yeah, there's a kind of sense of like what the pure substance would be when all accidents are removed. Is that the same as prime matter with all forms removed? Ah, well, so that brings us to the first reading from Plotinus. <laughs> um, That's a perfect segue, right? So Plotinus says, and Plotinus, remember, I said before was the founder or at least the, the the founder who's known to us of Neoplatonism. Right? He lived from 205 to well, I don't know what's the point of just copying this from the reading onto the board, but I <laughs> uh okay, I'm gonna erase these. Um Pinus lived from 205 to 270 AD. Um, and actually, we know what Plotinus looked like. If I, if I did PowerPoints, I would have a slide show, but I don't. But <laughs> he, he had like a really high forehead. He like, he's very odd looking, actually. <laughs> um, all right. Anyway, um, um, so. Uh, and Ray, what we have for Plotinus is this one big long book called the Aeneids that, as I said, was written down by a student for me. Um, this the style is very difficult, um, but which is partly why I only gave you a little bit of it. But um, so in this reading, he's talking about basically exactly that question. Right, like at the beginning of the second paragraph in the reading. Now, I mean, I, I was the one who decided where to make the paragraph break right there. But anyway, but if sensible substance does not exist without magnitude, nor without quality, how can we nevertheless separate the accidents from it? For separating these, magnitude, shape, color, dryness, moistness, what will be posited as the substance itself? Right, so that was the question I was, you know, kind of raising at the end last time, and Plotinus is raising it here, right? He's so he's saying, um, if, as you put it, the pure substance is supposed to be what's left when we take away all the quantities, qualities, and so forth. Um, 
Actually, Plotinus thinks that we can whittle down a list of categories to quantity bond generation, probably. Um, um, so, uh, um, but anyway, you take away all the qualities and quantities, and what you're left with is supposed to be the pure substance. But that's still not supposed to be the same as prime matter. It's supposed to have its own specific nature that makes it what it is. And Plotinus says, what could that be? <laughs> right? So like, and, you know, the way I put it last time was I drew the picture of Socrates and I said, you know, okay, here's the whiteness in Socrates, but it's not just color, right? So like, here's the five foot highness in Socrates and here's the human body shapeless in Socrates. <laughs> Those are all accidents. So I didn't draw this picture right. You know, what there really is, is a kind of like unknown something that all these accidents are in. <laughs> what is that? Right? And so this is the, this circle, which is uh, the, these are the Doritos and this is the bowl. <laughs> The bowl is the substantial form, <laughs> and the dip is the matter. <laughs> All right. So again, I didn't come up with this. One of my former students did, but um, I used to just draw it that way. But I didn't. I didn't have that description. All right. So so right. So it turns out that this is something kind of mysterious. What could it be? And um, Plotinus says. Um, What is there which the things that make being a substance of some quality out of being a substance only pertain to as accidents? And will the whole fire not be substance, but only something of the fire, like a part of it? What could that be? Answer, matter. Right, so he's saying, like, um, he's, so he's taking air, I mean, okay, I guess, let me put it this way. <coughs> the, the, so the answer seems to be that something like, well, okay, what makes fire, fire is heat. But that's really an accident. So I guess fire is just like substance with a certain accident. This is Plotinus' line of thought. But he, like he's, he's saying this is what Aristotle has to say. Because remember, Aristotle did say that heat was a differentia of fire. So, um, so this, this bowl turns out to be kind of generic, actually. I mean, right, that is, it pertains to the genus substance, not to the species. I mean, that's where the word generic comes from, right? So this bowl turns out to be kind of generic. It's really Plotinus is saying, Aristotle, you know, really, you, you think substantial form is going to make one kind of substance different from another, but all the things that really make substances from different from another have been subtracted before you get to the pure substance. So what you're left with is just this thing that all the substances have in common. But then Plotinus says, what is that? Well, the thing that all substances have in common but that has no specific nature of its own is prime matter. Right, and so Plotinus continues, but then indeed sensible substance will be a certain combination of qualities and matter. 
And, but he's using quality in a general sense, as you can tell for the next sentence, the qualities and or quantities, right? Um, then indeed, sensible substance will be a certain combination of qualities in matter, right? So there is no goal. <laughs> so, so Plotinus' theory of sensible substance, now I'll say in a second what this dotted line is, but Plotinus' theory of sensible substance is that there's a bunch of accidents like V and shape and size and quantity, right? Um, and they're kind of glommed together in prime matter. And that's it. Now, um, this is, I mean, this, first of all, is clearly an anti Aristotelian theory, right? Plotinus is, in saying this, is is taking a position against Aristotle. And remember, I said that, that, um, that that's true early in the history of Neoplatonism, and especially with Plotinus, there's an emphasis on we follow Plato, not Aristotle. Although you can also see, as, as I also said, that the understanding of what it means to follow Plato is like all put in terms of words that are introduced by Aristotle, mm -hmm. and form and nature. And, um, and, and matter and substance and accidents and so on and so forth. Um, but you can, so you can tell that Plotinus intends this as an attack on Aristotle and not as an interpretation of Aristotle because he goes on to say the opposite of a sentence that Aristotle says, <laughs> right? Namely, that sensible substance is composed of accidents. And right, you understand why it's not easy to tell whether someone's interpreting Aristotle or staking out a position against Aristotle because everyone disagrees what Aristotle means, right? So just because someone says the opposite of what you think Aristotle means, you can't tell that they're trying to be anti-Aristotelian. And actually, you, I mean, you see this mistake, I think, I mean, seems to me a mistake. A lot of times in history of um, especially medieval philosophy where people will say something like, um, you know, Avicenna argues against Aristotle that blah, 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 blah. And it's because they're comparing what Avicenna says to something that they've learned that Aristotle means or something like that. But if they read Avicenna carefully, they would understand that Avicenna thinks that that's what Aristotle means. He's not arguing with Aristotle. He rarely argues Aristotle. He's a very strict Aristotelian. Right. So, um, but so how can you tell? And again, you can tell if they take a sentence that's in Aristotle and literally put a knot at the beginning of it, right? Now you know that's not intended as an interpretation of Aristotle. Right. So that's what Plotinus is doing here. So, th so this is not a solution to the problem of the categorical status of the differentiate in the sense that it doesn't accept the Aristotelian framework, but says the framework is wrong, right? So like the differentiate of, of sensible substances are accidents because sensible substances are not really substances. They're not really, they're made of accidents. And I know there are a bunch of questions that I didn't stop for. Are they still there? Yes. Um, so I'm just a little confused. So the Dorito bowl that yes. you showed, that is what Aristotle argues, which is that like substance, like it's like matter, substance, parts, or qualities. Whereas um, uh, the other person is arguing, Plotinus is arguing against that by saying that quality, substance, and matter are all on the same like playing field, and that substances are actually made of accidents. That's right, of accidents and matter. But the, oh, right, and so matter. right, so again, in the Aristotelian picture, there's supposed to be two kinds of change: accidental change and generation and corruption. And one involves accidents changing, while the substance remains the same. While the other means means the substantial form itself changes, and the only thing that continues is the prime matter. And Plotinus, you know, like in a couple of steps, broke that down where to the point where 
all there is is accidents and murder. Okay. Now, I mean, you could, there's a couple things you could ask about this. Number one, then, Matthias, why are you even talking about substance and accidents in the sensible world? Don't, I, don't you mean that there really is no difference? And Plotinus says, well, no, I mean, we do have a, a, a use for the <clears throat> term substance um, in the sublunar, in the, sorry, in the sensible world. Um, um, but, uh, you know, there's certain combinations of these accidents that we call kind of substance, like water or fire. So, um, and then an accident, these are all accidents, right? He's, he, he's careful to make sure you understand. He doesn't mean that once it's part of a substance, it's not an accident. Right? He says, no, even there in the substance that it that it completes, that it's part of, it's still an accident. But when we talk about accidents as opposed to substance, we mean other accidents that attach to this combination that we're already thinking of as substance. So they're the same kind of things, and it's just a matter of which ones we consider as making up a whole and which ones we think of as added on. Yeah. So in the example with fire, the accidents are heat and matter, and those are always accidents, despite the fact that they make up the substance fire. Right. Well, the matter isn't really an accident, right? The matter is the the matter is the dip, right? So the matter is is the subject that receives the accidents. Um, I mean, as a center will say matter that isn't isn't the subject this situation, but the way Plotinus is thinking about it, right? So the accidents are in matter, right? I mean, that, um, you still have to explain, and, you know, I mean, if this were a course about Neoplatonism, we we'll go into the Platonic text that he's also alluding to here, right? I mean, Plato still has to explain how this, how change is possible, right? He and Aristotle are both opposed to the pre-Socratics who, who argue that change is impossible. So, I mean, uh, you, you still have to explain, you know, you still need something for the accident to kind of change around him. So you, but yeah, so so fire, so I mean, assuming that the essence of fire is just heat or extreme heat, as they say, right? <laughs> then then in the case of fire, the only accident inside this would be heat. <laughs> and then like the, of course the fire also has other accidents like size, shape, and whatever. And but those are so like um but it's not like these are accidents and this one isn't. They're all accidents, but we're counting. These are, in this situation, are being referred to as accidents in a stronger sense because we're not counting them as part of the substance. Or something like that. Yeah. Um, does Aristotle also, does Aristotle see qualities as accidents? Yeah, quality was one of the nine non substance characters. Right. But we don't know what Aristotle thinks about heat in the case of fire. That's part of the problem, right? Because Aristotle said that heat is what makes fire a fire in, oh. in the reading from on generation and corruption. Yeah. So would the big difference between Plotinus and um, the popular interpretation of Aristotle be the idea of differentiate? The idea that there's matter, accidents, and then Aristotle would say, something else that defines the substance and Plotinus says no there's no something else there's just accidents and matter right uh, except well there is no something else except and so here's what this dotted line means oh. this is the sensible world gotcha um, but Plotinus is a playlist, right oh, so there's so also perfect. up there yeah. the realm of reforms or and intellect, 
right? This is a kind of compromise. I mean, not that Plotinus looked at it as a compromise, it was a kind of compromise between Plato and Aristotle, mm -hmm. right? Like Aristotle said that the immaterial substances are intellects, whereas Plato said they're forms. Then Plotinus's uh, sphere of intellect, there are intellects and forms. <laughs> All right, and they're kind of the same thing, but anyway, right. So, so, the, so there isn't something else down here, right? But, um, but Plotinus agrees that you that, and also for this purpose, you have to remember that the Greek word, and we're still in Greek. Right in the Roman Empire, uh, most philosophy was still written in Greek. Um, so the Greek word that we're translating as substance, usia, you know, comes from the verb to be. It means like being or something. So in in particular, in Plato, this is the realm of being, and this is the realm of becoming. Mm -hmm. Right, so Plotinus agrees that something can't be truly called an usia if it's made of accidents. Right, and this is what he says, this is the end of the reading. And one ought not to bring difficulties if we make sensible substance out of non-substances. Which again, like if you, if you think of this word, it means like, like making beings out of non-beings. And why shouldn't why shouldn't we complain about this? Answer: For the whole sensible substance is not a true substance either. It is rather that which imitates the true substance. Which true substance has being without the other properties which are around it, and the other things even come to be from it because it truly is. But here in the sensible world, the subject that is matter is both sterile and not sufficient to be being because the other properties do not come from it either, but sensible substance is a shadow and a shadow upon that which is itself a shadow, a picture and a mere appearance, right? So, so there is something else. Right, this is the form of water. <laughs> now, the form of water doesn't have any accidents. It doesn't have things that kind of glommed onto it from somewhere that befell it, right? Rather, every property of it emanates from its own nature. It's sufficient to itself, right? And what we have down here is an image of it. Um, so if I mean, this was supposed to be fire, now it's supposed to be water, so make this moisture instead of water, right? So, like, um, um, so there's a reason we call what's the accidents that are inside this circle parts of a substance and say this is a sensible substance, but it's not a reason you find down here in the sensible world. The reason is up here, right? It's because they image this form. And so like the relationship between sensible substance and true substance, according to Plotinus, is like the relationship. So remember what Aristotle's example of the equivocal use of a term was. We call a human an animal, or we call a picture an animal. Right? That's what that's exactly what this relationship is. Right? Only only um, um Plotinus, and this is you know how he understands what it is to be a Platonist, or part of how he understands what it is to be a Platonist, says that you know the true animal is up here. What everything that's down here is at best a picture. Yeah. Sorry, can you just say what the relationship the relationship between sensible substance and true substance is people on the right path? Right. So I mean again, Plotinus says that sensible substance is called substance because it's an imitation of true substance. Right? Or again, if you think of it as meaning being, 
You say, right? You could say something down here is called a being, and it's an image of something in the realm of three beings. It's a picture of it, in some sense of picture. <laughs> Okay, so I mean, um, this type of picture with the with with the immaterial thing up here and something else down here is going to keep coming up in the course, right? I mean, it's uh, it's present in different ways in the, in the different rationalists. And it's present in different ways in the other in the Aristotelians I'm about to discuss. Um, but uh, but uh, depending on what you say about it, you mark yourself as an Aristotelian or an anti-Aristotelian. Plotinus is marking himself as an anti-Aristotelian by saying there are no true substances down here. Yeah. So what makes something a true substance versus like how how is what is a true substance if a sensible substance is a reflection of a true substance? Well, I mean, this for example is not can't be generated or corrupted. Why? This right, it doesn't change its properties. It can't change into air, right? It's okay. um it's not found in different places, it's not scattered or dispersed, it's one. Um, so it has being in a truer sense than anything down here in the sense of the world has being. Okay, so that's Plotinus, and now I'm going to go on to Porphyry. And so Porphyry, you know, as I keep saying, is Plotinus' student. Um, I'm going to erase this that for now. And we'll read it again, hopefully. Uh, so, um, and Porphyry, again, we have only approximate dates for Porphyry, but so, um, um, so if these dates are correct, then he's like 30 years younger than the time. But these dates are circa. <laughs> All right. Um, and Porphyry actually was a uh, Phoenician. Uh, Porphyry wasn't his, his real name. His real name was um, Malchus, which um, the Phoenician was a Semitic language. It means king. Um, so apparently Porphyry was like a nickname because it, Porphyry is like the purple that came here. Um, all right. Anyway, um, so, uh, um, so Porphyry, you know, is definitely a big fan of Plotinus. He edited Plotinus's works and wrote a life of Plotinus, but he's already moving the tradition much closer to Aristotle. Right, and arguing that there isn't as big a difference between Plato and Aristotle as we might have thought. And so he's going to try to give an interpretation of what Aristotle says about substance and, ac and accidents that, you know, that makes it true that there are, that there's a difference between substance and accidents in the, in the, in the sensible world. Of course, he still agrees that there, are st there is stuff like this, but that's not what we're focusing on for now. The question is the picture of what this is like. And this, so the reading is from um, a commentary on the categories. Apparently, he also had a much longer category commentary on the categories that does not survive. This is a shorter commentary on the categories, and it was put in the form of a dialogue, but it, it's not really very much of a dialogue. It's, the, it's really like the two speakers are the teacher and the student. 
And basically it's a quiz of the teacher asks the student, what do you say about this? What about this? So the student always gets the right answer. So it's very boring. <laughs> um, why you decided to write it in that form, I'm not sure. Maybe you were supposed to use it to practice, you know, like cover the answer. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> anyway. Um, so, um, and in this part of the dialogue, uh, you know, they start, it starts with the student um, explaining uh, why, uh, not being in a subject is not a proprium of substance. So this, I mean, like everything in the dialogue, it's it's basically, well, actually I should say, like almost everything in the dialogue, it's basically taken from Aristotle, one Aristotelian text or another and like slightly paraphrased, right? And, and rearranged. Um, don't do this in your papers. About what, no, actually, I mean, you can't really plagiarize from Aristotle, right? Like that's called illusion. <laughs> but, uh, well, so anyway, um, uh, um, and so like the student says, and we saw this in our uh, readings from Aristotle, that it's not being in a subject is not a proprium of substance because the differentiae are also not in the subject. Right? Again, that's a quote from Aristotle. Um, and then the teacher says, if then a differentiae is neither a substance, for you said that it is not a substance, although it too is not in a subject, just as a substance is not in a subject, nor an accident, for it is not in a subject, right? So that was the same dilemma I raised last time based on reading X from Aristotle. What is it? And so like, as I was saying, throughout most of the dialogue, we're just reading quotes from different parts of Aristotle rearranged, but he never says anything about Aristotle. At this point, the student says, Aristotle says that it is neither a quality only, for it would be an accident, nor a substance only, for it would be counted together with the secondary substances, but is rather this whole thing a substantial quality. So substantial quality is not a phrase found in Aristotle. <laughs> Right. That is the one time the student actually says Aristotle says this. That's the time when it's something that Aristotle doesn't actually literally say. <laughs> right. That's why the student's saying it. That right that, to make sure that we understand that Porphyry is attributing this view to Aristotle, even though it's not these words aren't literally found in Aristotle. <laughs> right. So. Um, Right, he says it's right. It's usio des. It's like a it's like a weird invented word. Um, substantial. It's a substantial quality. And then the student goes on to explain the theory of substantial qualities. Right, so that like um, qualities which complete substances are substantial. Those qualities qualities are. Complete, completive, completive. I, I was the one who, who decided to use this word, but I don't know how to pronounce it. Those qualities are completive, which, when they pass away, corrupt their subjects. But those which, coming to be and passing away, do not corrupt their subjects would not be substantial. Such as, for example, that heat belongs to hot water and belongs also to fire, but it does not belong substantially to water. For the heat being removed, the water having come to be cold is not corrupted. Whereas it belongs substantially to fire. For the heat being removed, it corrupts the fire. Right? So here the idea is there is a bowl. Of course, there's still a dip, right? I mean, it's definitely matter. But now we're saying there is a bowl, but the bowl is like made partly of. 
things that elsewhere we would count as accidents. Right? So like this is if this is fire, part of the substantial form of fire is heat. Now, I mean, you can already see why, like, part of the way of like getting around certain problems in Aristotelian texts. So if you say, wait, then isn't this an accident? The answer is no, because remember the definition of in a subject, that is the definition of an accident is in something, not as a part, but this is a part. <laughs> yes. Um, can, I think I'm getting confused. Can um, qualities that are simply substances that are, can the substantial quality also be at the same time the differentiate or those two different arguments? No, so it will be, it, it will be a differentiate. Right. Okay. That's that's what the student is trying to explain. And I mean, the student that is Porphyry is trying mm -hmm. to explain um, what the differentiate could be. And he says, right. you know, Porphyry is he, the student. Actually, the Neoplatonists were, were famous for having both men and women in their students. Um, although uh, I don't think any of the writings that survived from the school of them. So, Whatever that's worth. But in any case, so the student um, or Porphyry is saying that um, that uh, a differentia is a quality. He doesn't say that they could be quantities. Um, why? Well, for one thing, remember Aristotle said that differentia is always a quality. Now we're taking that literally. Differentia is always a quality, but it's a special quality. It's a, it's a quality that makes up part of a substance. And so right here, doing this, it's not an accident, even though it belongs to an accidental non-substantial category. Yeah. Um, but so if the differentia is a substantial quantity, are substantial qualities always differentia or no? Can they just stand alone as a substantial quality? Well, okay, that's a good question. I mean, I think it's clear based on what Porphyry is using this for here that, that Porphyry thinks they're always differentiated, okay. right? Um, but could there be kind of extra essential qualities that are, I mean, what would, unless it's a quality that all substances have in common, it's going to be somewhere, it's going to be a differential, right? Um, of course, there is a quality, or anyway, rather a quantity that, that all um, sensible substances have in common, namely they're all bodies. Um, so uh, there is, I mean, that's still a differentiate in the bigger picture, right? Like it differentiates sensible substances from immaterial, super sensible substances, but um, there is something weird about that property or quality or quantity or whatever it is. Um, and uh, um, it's like people in late antiquity and the Middle Ages spend a long time, a lot of time talking about what being a body is for that reason. I mean, it's, you know, it's weird because, for example, whenever a body is corrupted, whatever comes to be afterwards is always still a body. So the form of body itself is never lost, right? Like it's always, um, and in fact, bodies are apparently are corrupted by being divided. And we're gonna see how important body is to the early modern people. 
So if there were room for more readings in this course, I would have included a bunch of readings about body. But anyway, sorry. So right. So for the most part, the idea is that this, yeah, the substantial qualities are the differential. And this, so you can see that's why like they're different from the secondary substance. So the secondary substance is the form. And a differentia is a quality that's part of the form. So that's the sense in which they're not substances, right? Remember, we have to explain both parts of that reading X. They're not substances, but they're not accidents either because they're in substances at the part, right? And then as opposed to something like the shape of the fire, which is a true accident. You, so these are both in the genus of quality. Um, but one of them is is an accident and the other one isn't. And when you feel the fire, right? Like when you put your hand near the fire, you're feeling its substantial form. Right? I mean, so this is how it works. Like, here's your hand. Um, this, the heat that's in the fire causes heat in your hands. Yeah. Uh, so if you keep the substantial quality slash differentia, but then remove every other quality of it, is it still the same substance? Every other non-substantial quality? Yeah. Yeah, it's still the same substance. Now, I mean, of course, you can't really do that, right? Like, you can't have a substance with no shape or size. <laughs> but, um, but, but this, but you can do something that's almost as good. Namely, you can change all. Of it, yeah. Right. And we'll see, we'll see, like Descartes in the second meditation using that technique to, to discuss what a lump of wax is and saying you can change the color, you can change the shape, you can change the size, you can change the solidity, the smell, et cetera, and it's still the same something. Right, so the, the same thing is here true. You can change all the other accents and it will still be fine. But if you change the heat, it will be corrupted. It will no longer be fine. Yeah. Um, if the substantial qualities are um, are qualities, but not accidents. Are, if they're also under the category of substance, wouldn't that contradict the need to get everything to be in one of the 10 categories? Right, so uh, I mean, apparently what this solution means is that it's, it's, it's not true that everything in the same genus or even in the same species has to be either accident or not accident. Right. So like this heat in my hand is an accident. This heat in the fire is not an accident. And yet they belong to the same species. But the heat in the fire, is that a substance? No, but it's it's part of a substance. It's part of the substance. But so remember what Aristotle says is you can't make a substance out of accidents. It's not an accident. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Um, for something more complicated than fire, how could you figure out what one um, substantial quality would be? Like, like yeah. if you take like a bear, what is the quality of a bear when, when which taken away, the bear is no longer a bear? Like, yeah. I... I don't know. I can't. Yeah. Is it fur? Because there must there must be hairless bears. I don't know. Yeah. So I mean, again, you're channeling the empiricists, right? I mean, this is like you know, this is a serious question. How how do we know? You know, um, uh, I mean, so when we get to Avicenna's solution, we'll see that in a way he has something that makes it better, but in a way it makes it worse. <laughs> but but for Porphyry's solution, yeah, you might think that you should be able to tell by sensing the bear what it is that makes it a bear, 
right? Yeah. It should be a sensible quality of the bear. That's, Stare into the bear's eyes. Yeah, that's probably a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> Unless the bear is in a cage or something. But <laughs> there um, have to be only one substantial quality in, in the corporate system? You know, so in the isagogy, it definitely sounds like there's one differentia for each species. Um, uh, but I have wondered, you know, sometimes when it, like in this text, the student seems to go back and forth between different, different definitions of human, and I'm not sure what to make of that. Like sometimes saying bipedal is the differentia, and other times saying that rational is the differentia. Um, um, and I mean, you can ask the same question about Aristotle himself. Sometimes it sounds like every species must have one true differentia, but other times it sounds like maybe there could be more than one. Like, for example, the passage we read from Generation and Corruption, where it said that each of the elements is defined by a, a combination, right? Like heat, hot and dry, or cold and moist, yeah. Um, again, there'll, there'll be a kind of unequivocal answer to that from Avicenna, but it's gonna come at a serious cost. <laughs> yeah. Does Aristotle or anyone in this like uh, tradition ever provide a, a method or a way of determining what exactly the differentia of any substance would be, or of any like it just, it just or do you just go on like faith that that's what the differentia is, you know has to be? Um, well, so again, maybe well. Uh, So it's get, that question again is going to look different from post Avicenna versus pre Avicenna, right? So, but from this point of view, like, yeah, the question is, how do we know that? How do I know that this thing that I sense when I put my hand near the fire is part of its substantial form? And uh, do they give a way of telling? No, not really. <laughs> I mean, uh, um, and there, not only do I have a way of telling, there's very few examples, right? As I said before, the main examples are the elements and human beings. And both of those examples are also, are actually a little bit unclear, right? Because in the case of elements, do, both, do they each have two differentiae or? Um, but it seems like they're not on the same level, right? Like water can become hot and still be water, but it can't become dry and still be water. Well, I shouldn't say that. Avicenna says that when water becomes ice, it's dry. <laughs> All right, but um, um, but uh, yeah. So, but from, from in this picture, it looks like yeah. That, and this for human beings, there's this constant going back and forth between is it a bipedal featherless land animal or is it a rational mortal animal what is it and like the early modern people complain about this i guess you know you have to to understand why that doesn't bother them very much you have to like think about what they're using this for like they're not really used like it's not important to know what the true differentia of bears is. It's right. I mean, this is for the purpose of understanding what sublunar things are like in general, how there can be such things, right? How they can change into each other and whatever. And it's like not so bad that we don't know exactly what the, the true differentia is. Um, but um Because, right, like there has to be some answer like that, you know, I mean, it can't be that it's, but from your point of view, this was just totally stupid that they never noticed us. <laughs> right, like that's not a plausible explanation. For what <laughs> I mean, like, uh, I, can, I can guarantee you that these people were not stupid. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, uh, yeah, like there was a change in point of view about what metaphysics and especially what physics might possibly be capable of, what it might be useful for. Um, and I think that's part of what made things that before were not a problem, made them like suddenly seem uh, completely intolerable. Um, all right, let me go on to Avicenna because I don't want to, um, this often happens when I give this lecture, but I hope it won't happen, that I won't have time to talk about the Eucharist at the end. <laughs> it's so cool. All right, so, all right. So the, like, the first reading I gave you here from Avicenna is titled, on the refutation of the, and I translated from Arabic pretty literally. So it, it, you know, you can tell that Arabic, although in some specific ways, Arabic is actually more like English than it is like Greek or Latin. But in most ways, it's pretty different. <laughs> All right. So on the refutation of the saying of one who says that one thing can be both accident and substance in two respects. And he starts, there have arisen astonishing doctrines on the issue of accident and substance, to which philosophers were led by the ambiguity that falls in the distinction between accident and form. Blah, 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 I left out some of the text. And then he says, due to the fact that the name quality is an equivocal name, they then heard that the differentiae of substances are substances. And they also heard that differentiae of substances are qualities. They did not know that the differentiae of substances are called by this name only equivocally, but thought that the quality, which is a category, which we'll mention later, included the differentiae of substances. And since that category of quality was according to them a category of accidents, the differentiae of substances turned out according to them to be accidents. But the differentiae of substances were also substances according to them, so that it was as if a, a thing were both substance and accident. Now, I mean, what I just said is not literally the way Porphyry puts it. Um, by the way, so I should say, what was translated into Arabic? Aristotle was translated into Arabic. Um, most of, Ar if not all of Aristotle's writings were translated into Arabic, although not all of them survive in Arabic. Right, so like sometimes we have, we don't have the Arabic original that they're talking about. But um, um, but also, although less of this survived, actually when I say it doesn't survive, there's there's a lot of manuscripts in like Timbuktu or whatever, and no one's ever looked at probably, and who knows? Some of these things may still be discovered. But what was also translated to Arabic was um, a lot of the ancient commentators on Arabic. Uh, and Aristotle, um, and not very much Plato, actually. Um, in fact, it's not clear whether even, like, say, Al-Farabi, who's, whose main, I don't know if I should tell his main work, one of his main works is basically, is based on Plato's Republic. It's not clear whether he had the entire text of the Republic or just a kind of like, uh, summary of it. Um, but anyway, um, so, uh, so in particular, I think this very uh, commentary of Porphyry's that we just read was available to Avicenna in Arabic. Um, we know there's actually there's a there's a bookseller's catalog from I think the tenth century or ninth century I don't know somewhere along there that 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 you know we. The, manuscripts of have survived and I have a copy of it in my office actually. Um, and it's so and you know uh, the bookseller lists for their clients all the things that they have seen or heard might be available. <laughs> right? So it's like not all things that they actually have in stock because remember this is before printing, right? So like it's you know, if you want to buy it, you have to find someone who has a manuscript and copy it. <laughs> so, um, right. So, uh, but anyway, so from that, a lot of times you can tell, you know, that so and so's commentary on Aristotle existed in Arabic, even though we don't have any copies of it now. 
Right. So, um, and I think Avicenna is basically in a kind of um, like somewhat mean way, maybe summarizing Porphyry's view, right? He's saying like they heard the differentiator were qualities, but they they heard they weren't qualities in the sense of accidents. So they decided they were both qualities and not qualities, or they were both quality and substance or something like that. Oops. Oh, no, no. Um, and then the next thing Avicenna says is, and if, as for us, we say that this is false and impossible, and that these examples are all false. <laughs> Right. So as I keep saying, everyone is Aristotelians, but that doesn't mean they agree with each other. On the contrary, <laughs> right? they, they disagree with each other very strongly. Right. And Avicenna says, and we say first that what we mean by substance, that we mean by substance, a thing says the true nature of its essence exists without being in any subject whatsoever. Um, by the way, I didn't write down Avicenna's years, did I? I just thought it was great. Avicenna is a Latinized form of his name. His name is Ibn Sina. Um, or I guess Ibn Sina is probably an Arabic form of his name because he was Persian. <laughs> I don't know what his name would be in Persian, but uh, anyway, uh, right, his dates were 982. He wrote mostly in Arabic. He did write some things in Persian, which I can't read because they're in Persian. But uh, <laughs> um, but he wrote mostly in Arabic because Arabic was the language of science and philosophy. Right? So, um, um, right. So, sorry, getting back to this. Um, so we say first that we mean by substance a thing such as the true nature of its essence exists without being in any subject whatsoever. That is, and now he gives his definition of in a sub in a subject, by which he's defining accident and therefore also defining substance. Right. So remember, can I erase Plotinus then? Are these things on the board visible in the videos? I'm afraid that this... You guys have watched the videos. Are they, are they visible? Okay. I'm also afraid that I often stand in front of them. Whatever. So, right, remember, in a subject, not in a subject, these are the substances and these are the accidents. So Avicenna says that a substance is something such that the true nature of its essence, and I think like that's not just extra words there. As you can see from a later part of the passage, he's emphasizing that if this is true of something, it's essentially true of Right, it's part of what it is that it has this property, and the property is not to be in the subject. What does it mean not to be in the subject? And of course, in order to explain that, he explains what it means to be in a subject, and then to be not to be in a subject is not to do that. Right, so does not exist in anything whatsoever, so it's in something. This was in Aristotle's definition not as a part of it, by a being such that, moreover, so this part is longer than what Aristotle says. I think, I mean, it's based partly on what the Arabic translation of Aristotle looks like here, but I'm not gonna go into that. I don't even remember the details at the moment, but, but okay, by a being such that, moreover, it is not possible that it be separated from the thing it exists in Whereas the thing it exists in is existent by itself. 
So it's longer than what Aristotle says, actually, in two ways. One is that he says, by a being such that, right? So that, again, is emphasizing that being in a subject is a mode of being. It's like a degree of being. It's a lesser degree of being, right? Substances are have the kind of being that can be by itself, not in a subject. Accidents exist by a being that such that it is not possible that it be separated from the thing it exists in. But then he also adds this other thing, whereas the thing it exists in is existent by itself. Right? So in order to count as being in a subject, two things have to be true. The, the thing that is the accident has to have a deficient mode of being such that it can't exist on its own. It's incapable. It doesn't have enough existence to exist on its own, right? That's number one. And number two, the thing that it's in, that is the subject, has to be such that it can exist on its own. So it's, if that's the definition of in a subject, a substance is something that isn't like that, right? So a substance is something that can exist on its own. Um, at least in order to exist, it doesn't need anything else that can exist on its own. <laughs> right? And I mean, that, so by doing that, Avicenna is by 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 adding those those things. Avicenna is doing two things here. First of all, he's making it clear that um, there can't be two things of the same kind, one of which is in a subject and the other isn't. Right? Because two things of the same kind definitely have to have the same kind of beat. Yeah. Is um, the argument that the substance can exist on its own, including matter with the substance, or no? Well, so that was the second thing I was about to say. Oh. The other thing he's doing, so by saying that this has to have a deficient mode of being, and that's why it needs to be in the subject, he's ruling out the idea that sometimes something just like this could be not an accident, right? But by adding that the thing that it's in the room, to count as a subject here has to be something that um, does have its own existence on its own. He's um, um, showing that matter doesn't count. Matter, because right, remember, matter is not something that has its own existence. It depends on form to be anything. It isn't anything in particular without a form. So like these two things together are are what's going to allow Avicenna to draw a completely different picture of what happens here. So instead, what happens is that there's the bowl. <laughs> um, it, it has parts, like differentiate or whatever. Um, but uh, um, the parts are not like of the same kind as any sensible quality. They're parts of substantial form. Now, if you ask what is the substantial form or what are these parts, the answer is, well, um, they're substances. And now if you say, uh, but they're in something. Well, the parts are in something, but they're in something as a part, right? So, so remember, the definition of in a subject is in, not as a part, 
And then that long third clause that I marked C in the room. So being in as a part doesn't make them not substances. Mm -hmm. But what about this? They're in matter. But that's the third clause takes care of that. <laughs> this doesn't count as being in a subject because matter doesn't have the, enough being of its own to count as a subject. Okay, but now, I mean, well, there's a couple things, but I, I one thing that I haven't really tied up is, you know, what about that place where Aristotle says that a differentia is not a substance? But to tell you what Avicenna says about that would be really complicated, so I'm not going to. But, um, but the other thing, more importantly, that I haven't uh, tied up is, um, and so there's, again, there's both a conceptual side to this and an uh, Aristotle interpretation side to it. So the conceptual side to it is, hold on a second, substances have sensible qualities, <laughs> right? Like fire is hot. It seems like it's always hot. Like, isn't porphyry or porphyry, you know, the student in porphyry right to say that if you take the heat away from a fire, it's not fire? So, and yet fire is, a, is definitely, I mean, heat is definitely a sensible quality. So that seems to be a problem with this picture. Um, and the Aristotelian interpretation part is, doesn't Aristotle say that heat is the differentia of fire or water in the ungeneration and corruption? Right. So this second reading from Avicenna, which is from the physics, right? So Avicenna wrote a bunch of books, but his like his main encyclopedia, encyclopedic work is called the Shifa, which means healing. Actually, it's um, also was the name of one of the hospitals in Gaza that was destroyed. Um, but in any case, uh, uh, not sure exactly why it's, I think it's supposed to heal you from your confusion, basically. Avicenna was also a physician, but this, but his book about medicine is not called the Shifa, it's called the Kanun, the canon of medicine, yeah. These guys, they care about like the accuracy in terms of the Bible too, but isn't there a scene in the Bible when there's like a burning bush that isn't actually hot? Well, okay, so Avicenna is Muslim, so the Bible is not actually the issue for him, but uh, um, um, I mean, they have, they have the whole article on the, the Eucharist or whatever. Right, that's Thomas Aquinas, right? Yeah. So, so for him, although the Eucharist notoriously is not clearly mentioned in the, the in the Bible, right? Like the Protestants would say, it. right. But anyway, um, uh, um, yeah. So, like, yeah, Thomas will take it upon himself to explain. I mean, it, Thomas and also Maimonides. We're not reading anything by Maimonides. The, you know, the, the greatest Jewish philosopher of the Middle Ages uh, spends a lot of time trying to explain how to understand the Bible. And of course, sometimes they'll say, "Well, don't take it literally," and other times they'll say, "Yeah, it's literally true, and this is how we can explain it." But um, um, so, like, how would Thomas explain that burning bush? Well. I mean, it's actually probably not going to be that different from the way you'd explain the Eucharist. So I think we can talk about it when we talk about that. But um, right. So anyway, here's the here's the reading from the physics part. So so the Shifa has you know has is divided into books, most of which, although not all of which, correspond roughly to some book of Aristotle's. But then Avicenna they takes things from different places and puts them together and puts his own explanation in or whatever. It's not, it doesn't go like sentence by sentence or anything like that. Um, okay, so here, here's what he says. The form of water, for example, is a power which constitutes the matter of water in species. And that power is not sensible. But from that power issue the sensible effects, such as sensible cold and weight. 
and then his little explanation in parentheses about what weight means and why it's a sensible quality and it's definitely an accent, right? Weight means that the, the body has an inclination to move when it's out of its natural place. To put it in its natural place and the weight goes away. <laughs> right? Take it out of its fat natural place and you can feel the weight. <laughs> um, okay, so so the picture is so let me do it with fire instead of water, even though he's talking about fire. So the picture now is that the substantial form of fire is something nonsensical. Um, if you ask what it is, well, really, we can only really say what it is by referring to the accident that it causes. Actually, Avicenna says that's true of the, the differentia rational as well, because, um, um, so, you know, in Arabic, the, um, just as in Greek means literally means like speaking. It was translated into Arabic in such a way that it also literally means speaking. And Avicenna says, we call the true differentia of human speaking because it's the nature that causes the sensible effect of speaking. Right? And similarly, we call the true differentia of fire, which is a part of its substantial form, heat, because it causes the accident of heat. Normal. Something could happen to interfere with this process. And actually, although I think Thomas disagrees with this, um, Avicenna thinks that, um, that fire actually sometimes is not hot. Naturally, not by mirror. When is it not hot? Well, when it very small pieces of fire mixed with pieces of the other elements. Um, the other elements like affect it in such a way that it doesn't have its normal uh, effects. So, um, and the, the different pieces of different elements all affect each other. And this is why the mixture can have a homogeneous quality. Right, so it has little pieces that are hot or cold or moist or dry, but they all kind of like interfere with each other in such a way that the quality that results is the same everywhere. That's part of Avicenna's theory of mixture, which I wrote a paper about once. Um, all right, so but um, um, but normally this happens, and so now let me put the hand back in the picture. So here's my hand. So the story, this part of the story is the same, right? I put my hand near the fire, the heat of the fire causes heat in my hand. And that somehow, never mind what the rest of the apparatus looks like, causes me to sense the heat. Um, but now this heat is not part of the fire. It's an effect of the fire. Like a sign that there's fire there, it's like smoke. <laughs> right? So I'm inferring that the fire is there from its effect. Um, right. So there's been an enormous change between these two pictures. And basically, everyone after Amazon follows this picture. <laughs> um, um, okay, and you know, I mean, this enables him to, to, you know, to solve a lot of other problems, right? Like, for example, if you ask, you know, well, so wait, does fire have one differentia or two differentia? He can say, look, it has one differentia. Right, there's one part of the substantial form that makes it fire, that makes it different from every other substance. But that one differentia has many effects, right? That's what he was saying in that, right? So it has many natural effects. So you could, like, we 
just as we can regard heat as the differential, even though it's not really, it's really an effect from which we infer the presence of the differentia, we could pick one of the other ones instead or some combination of them. And that's why it sometimes is unclear what the differentia of some species is, right? So now, as I said, all the questions about, so how do we know which is the right one now look different? And the answer is in a sense, we don't know. <laughs> we couldn't know because this is something nonsensical and we know about the world through our senses so we don't know what this is but we know its effects and we refer to it by means of its effects Ooh, i'm out of time i didn't get to talk about the eucharist crap <laughs> I'll just say, I'll just say one thing that, so like Thomas takes this in a different, like further by saying, by a miracle, accidents can be completely disconnected from substance, right? You can't have any accidents with any substance. So like the body of Christ can be present along with the accidents of being the size and shape and color of a wafer. And that's the explanation of the Eucharist. Um, but sorry, I don't have time to go into more detail. Okay. Uh, next time we'll start talking about yeah. the part. <laughs> See you there. That should not be allowed. What's the most part?